you know, every single time we'd go to Pakistan, I would go on my own account and I'd be like, you know, posting stories from like Hunza or Islamabad and, and people would be like, where are you? What is this place? And I'd be like, it's Pakistan. I'm in Islamabad. I'm at my house or, you know, wherever. Yeah. They'd be like, no, this is, this is in Pakistan. This isn't, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just, no, because everyone has this different perception. perception. Of Pakistan. Yeah, exactly. Having chai is like having a heart to heart with someone without realizing you're having a heart to heart with them. And that's what I've been doing these last few months with Pakistani diaspora all over the world. I want to welcome you to season one of Sham Ki Chai. Welcome everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sham Ki Chai, where I interview Pakistanis doing really cool things. I'm your host, Natasha, and today we have on our show, Ahmad Mia. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure, Natasha. How's it going? It's going great. Ahmad, you are incredible. You are an investor. You are a founder. You are a consultant. And you are the co-founder of one of my favorite Pakistani Instagram handles called Dastan Agbari. And I'm very excited to have you. So thank you so much for being here again. Tell me a little bit about what part of Pakistan you're from and where you grew up. Um, my parents are from Islamabad in Lahore. My oh. dad moved here in the 19th, early, early, early 70s to Dubai, and that's where I was born and raised. Um, so majority of my life I've spent over here. Um, and then nine years of my life when I was, I think, 15, 16, grade 10, I moved to Canada and then moved back over here as well. Got it. So um, in the last few interviews I've done, this term comes up a lot. It's called like third culture kids. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, this concept of like you're Pakistani, but you're raised somewhere and then you somehow end up in the West. So did you experience that? And where did your sense of belonging come from when either you were growing up in the or when you were in Canada? You know, like our household is very Pakistani. So I grew up watching like I remember watching like Anak Valajin and listening to Junaid Jamshed and like these kinds of things, right? So like I was very much at home with like the culture from the 90s from when I grew up. Yes. But when you go to school and, and especially when you go to school over here, there's like 300 different nationalities all, you know, put together. Um, and I, I didn't have that many Pakistani friends. I, I remember having four Pakistani friends growing up. So there was always that dissonance of where am I from? Where do I kind of belong? And what am I supposed to be doing? We used to go back every summer, but at that earlier age, um, at a younger age, I didn't really connect with Pakistan at all. I think I started connecting with Pakistan at a very late stage, like I would say maybe six, seven years ago. Every single time I'd go back, I wouldn't get to experience the country like I would personally want to experience the country. So it would always be with cousins and then like security and are you able to kind of go out? Are you not able to go out? And then there was this this innate fear like you know like it's it's dark or like it's it's a, it's a gully you don't want to go there you don't know what's going to be there so there's the whole kind of media thing you know what they say like never believe what you hear on the media majority yes. of the times I mean yes. I believed all of it I was like eating okay. it up um, and I wasn't able to have my own experience and when I would travel everywhere um, like I spent a year in, in France Portugal Spain Morocco and all over the world and when you open up yourself, when you're able to kind of open up your heart and really let people in and let other cultures in, mm. you start making this family and this sense of friendship around you. And it's, it's just, it allows you to really experience a different kind of culture. Mm. Um, and for me, that happened like seven, eight years ago in Pakistan when I went alone um, with a friend of mine, actually. And I was able to experience Pakistan and go around um, without some kind of bias to family or to anything else it was just i have a car i'm going around and whoever i meet on the street or whoever i meet in a restaurant or in the meetings that i had that's how it's going to you know change the perspective of the country. So let's talk a little bit about your time in toronto and so where did you go to school and what did you study when you were in toronto so I moved there in grade 10. I studied high school there and then moved to Hamilton. Um, very cold, very, you know, old people. Not but like, yeah, not Dubai at all. And that's, that's also why, right? Like it was a massive shift in culture. Um, you're going from, you know, these private schools and everything like that all the way to, to Canada where the society is 
structure it completely differently. So it really opens your eyes. So I was in Hamilton for a year, I was studying biotech, um, didn't want to be a doctor. I cannot look at blood for the life of me. Okay. So I ended up leaving and going to Ryerson and studied finance and wanted to kind of, you know, still finish with everyone that I started with. So fast track that degree, didn't go back to Dubai for like, I think a couple of years and uh, graduated in finance. And then I did a specialization in digital media and entrepreneurship from this incubator slash accelerator space that they opened up in, uh, in downtown called the digital media zone. That's really cool. So how did your family take, um, you know, the fact that you didn't take a tradition, traditional career path of like doctor, yeah, engineer. Oh, my dad, my parents have never kind of forced us or wanted us to do. And like, I mean, they were just like, just go and do whatever you want. Oh, like, cool. Get out of here. Okay. Get out of Dubai. That's what you need to do. Because I wanted to go to AUS. I was like, I'm just going to, you know, stay here um, in my comfort zone. I'll finish off school here. I'll finish off university here. And like, my dad was like, no. So it was very difficult. Like the first year or two years, I barely had any friends. And thankfully, that allowed me to kind of understand myself a little bit more and see where I was wrong or where I was right and how to kind of rectify that. Uh, so for me, it was a very like I always say, like I was born and raised here, but I was my 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 formative years were were spent in Canada, and that kind of you know it really kind of uh, helps you take away any kind of. Uh, misconceptions of the world that you have because you're meeting people from all kinds of uh, all walks of life um, so in that sense it was just understanding the world a little bit better not not everyone you know gets dropped off to school or not everyone the whole entitlement and privilege was gone away I was cleaning my whole like the house myself I was doing everything myself you know like these small privileges yeah that we take for granted sometimes yeah. either in Pakistan or in Dubai um, you know you do yourself. I was taking three buses to go to school, whereas over here I was getting dropped off in, you know, in a car. Um, I was cleaning the whole house myself. I was doing laundry myself. I mean, a lot of my clothes got messed up, but at least I learned. At least I am self-sufficient. I learned how to cook there, and now I love cooking, so I, I still cook a lot. So a, a lot of those like formative things that you need as to be human, to be a, a person, I learned over there. You know, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and dive a little bit into your career, which I, I mean, it's incredible. When, when we were chatting, I think it was last week, you were telling me about all of the awesome things you did. And I could barely keep up. My typing could barely keep up with all the notes I was trying to take. And so you, um, I mean, you started off in you finance, you mentioned you worked at an Apple store, um, you know, you've invested, you design Condé Nest like app. And so please, um, let's dive into it from the beginning. Um, tell us about your career journey. Um, I still don't think I've achieved anything yet, but if I start off, like I think my first job was at 21, 20, okay. yeah, 20, like right before I graduated university and that was in an Apple store. And I remember specifically, I was in Dubai when I got the, when I got the letter and I didn't even know that I'd applied for it. And they're like, we want to interview you. And so I was like, okay, I'm not staying here. I want to go back to Canada. Like I usually, like when I was in university, like I'd always want to spend as much time as possible in Canada. But then when I got that particular email, I remember I was like, okay, I'm booking my ticket tomorrow and I'm going back. Mm -hmm. um, and I went through like four interviews, got the job as a, as a specialist, I think they're, they were called. Like the salespeople, that was my first job. I was a salesperson at an Apple store. Within six months, I think, or no, actually I stayed there for like four months, but within the first month or two, I made them like $6 million. I was really good at selling Apple products. I, I'm like, I'm like 10 products right here as well. I'm just a geek That's when it comes insane. to- That's insane, $6 million? Uh, yeah, I was one of the top hundred, like top 10 out of like 120 Ooh, uh, okay. salespeople. And these guys have been there forever. Uh, so they, they, they promoted me to, to, to the business kind of tier of things. And I used to like, you know, do that. Yeah. And, uh, so that was, I think one of the most fun periods and I didn't stay for too long because I was graduating. And then I started thinking like, oh, like I'm graduating. I should not be in a, in a retail store. I should, yeah. um, get a prop, a proper job, a proper proper job. job. what yeah, is, definitely. yeah. What is a proper job? Yeah, so exactly. then I got into, into CIBC Mellon in, 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 in Toronto and I was doing fund accounting for about a year. And I think that was the most boring period in my life. Okay. Like I hated it. I despised going to work. And I remember I got so good at it that like in six months, I used to take like three hour lunches. I had like, my, like, as I was on, I remember I was on Bay and uh, Bay and Bay, and, not Bay and Blower, Bay and 
Adelaide, Bay in Adelaide. Yes, that okay. was my thingy. That's where Suits, if you've seen Suits, that's where it was shot. Ah, that's where Suits is filmed. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. I used to go, I, there was this kefir place and I used to go have my ice cream, I'd like go for walks and like come back, like chill, no, no issues. So I did that for about a year. And, and then I remember having a conversation with my brother. We were in, in Dubai and he's like, dude, you look miserable. Like what's going on? I was like, I hate my job. Mm. So he's like, you're 22, 23. What the hell are you doing? Just go and quit. Yeah. So I did. I literally went back um, and I gave my resignation the next day and didn't know what I was going to do. And I, that's when I went back to my back to school, went did a specialization in digital media and entrepreneurship because that's what I wanted to kind of get into. And that's where I started designing iPhone apps and, and like kind of understanding the app world. That's where the iPad had just come out. So we were working on this, uh, this like zoo app and, and le learning how to market it and stuff like that. And then we were working on this, uh, on this alarm clock that just was designed better, like stuff like this. Okay. And then I remember moving back to Dubai because of my brother's wedding. So I came here for my brother's wedding mm -hmm. and I ended up getting a job at the holding company for Condé Nast, I helped them design the first iPhone app, iPad app, um, left them and then became the head of Nestle, Mercedes and Ikea, Middle East, North Africa for social media and digital strategy. Mm -hmm. So I was working at an agency helping all of these different brands. And that was super fun. And, and, you know, like understanding how social media works, understanding how strategy works. And, and at that point, we also, we were helping Nestle build their, 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 um, their listening kind of platform where they were, they had this, they have this, and they have this amazing room. I remember that's, that's where my office used to be. And I used to go to the Nestle like once or twice a week and spend time there and they had like screens everywhere like you know when, have you seen batman i think it's batman begins or batman like that screen where you're monitoring every single thing that's going on so he helped do that uh, and it was such a fun period in my life as well and uh, but after like i think i have this add kind of issue like this career yeah. add yeah. so two years later i was like okay i'm done and i started traveling again and yeah. ended up starting my own company like when i came back here i ended up starting my own company teaching people how to code um, okay. One of the experiences that I had had in Canada was going to these workshops where it was called uh, Ladies Learning Code, and it's majority women. Um, and you go there and you, you you experience coding, which is something that's very dry or tech nerdy normally, yes. but you you do it in an experience, like in an experiential setting where you have lunch together. There's music. There's like it was just amazing as an experience. Yeah. And so I wanted to kind of replicate something like that in Dubai. Okay. But I ended up launching Project Code. Um, and ended up getting Dubai government as one of my clients and different art institutions as my clients. And then and I think 80% of the, the workshops that I did were, were, were women, which was great. Cause like, you know, like when you think about coding it's, it's tech nerdy. And then when you think about it over here it's even more male dominant, like, you know behind the computer kind of thing. Um, so I, I think I was able to do that and it went really well. Then we did some kids workshops as well. Those went really well. And How was it going from corporate to, to having your own company? Oh, um, I think I worked more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, like, I was more excited, you know, like I was more excited to like find different ways of getting people and, and talking to people. And also like when you're, I mean, I think the, I became much more comfortable in talking to people at Apple and I, that mm -hmm. because you're forcibly, you're, 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 you're selling. And then yeah. there you're selling something that you love. And then that started to be applied to project code as well. So okay. I was getting people who were like, you know, uh, people from like these agencies and um, corporate lawyers and, and people who didn't have the background of coding, but I think I was able to empathize because I didn't have that. And after project code, I got headhunted to become the head of e-commerce and digital uh, well, digital, not e-commerce, but helping them help uh, design their e-commerce stuff for Level Shoes, which is a, it was a Shalhoub Group brand, which is one of the biggest um, fashion houses based out of the Middle East. They have JVs with Chanel, Gucci, Prada, Louis Vuitton, and all of these guys. Mm -hmm. And I helped them design their first website and then help them grow the brand across eight different markets. And that was super fun because I was getting, I'm into fashion. I like, uh, you know, kind of understanding different brands and how people market and brand marketing and understanding e-commerce as well and looking at customer acquisition and how do you do storytelling online? So it was super fascinating for me. Um, and I loved it. It was two years and, and we grew the business and yeah, it was, it was a phenomenal time. I got to meet some amazing people, got to like understand the fashion industry in Dubai as well. Um, and then I left around three years ago. Uh, no, now it's been like four or five years. Um, I left them and I started traveling. I was like, I don't know what to do. And I remember I, I, I sat down with my boss and I was like, you know, I, I think I'm done. I, like, I want to travel a little bit more. 
And she's like, why? And at that time, I remember I told her, like, I think I want to get married. That's that's why. Because I like, you know, you want to you want to leave on good terms. Like, so yes. I, I mean, I still love her. Like, I just had a con- like I just still speak to her. I, I spoke to her last week, actually. But at that point, I was like, you know, I was like 26, I think, 25, 26. I was like, I want to get married. You know, I want to travel yeah. a little bit and then I want to get married. So she's like, okay, yeah. fine, dude, do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. So for three or three and a half years, I just traveled. I was in France for about a year uh, and then just like started going around everywhere and, and consulting. Mm. different startups based in Dubai, but living in Europe. Um, and that was an amazing time period. Like it was just so much fun to be able to just, you know, I want uh, pastis nata, I would like fly to Portugal. If I want to uh, go and have pasta, I'd, I'd go to Italy. Like I was literally living that kind of, you know, um, on a whim. But I can't do that anymore. I mean, my wife hates me because, I mean, she doesn't hate me, but like because of COVID, we can't, you know, we're, we're stuck. So that life kind of, you know, has evaporated, uh, so to speak. But, uh, you know, and and that period was where I was like freelancing and doing different clients. And then I remember coming back here and speaking with my brother. My brother was thinking about doing conferences. And so we got together and we did this conference in the desert. And I loved the whole experiential part. And he wanted to bring like, you know, VCs and and stuff like that. VCs and hedge funds, basically. So we were doing a a tech conference, a tech VC conference Mm -hmm. in the desert that's experiential with the CIOs and CEOs of top end hedge funds and venture capital companies like uh, um, like Chamath Pali Hep- uh, Hepatia was, the, oh, uh, was there and uh, David Fialco and all of these uh, like really top end VCs. And the idea was how do you kind of create something that's, you know, not experienced in the Middle East. So right. we did this first conference, 120 people um, in the middle of the desert. And, you know, it was, it was just amazing for four days, no phones, no nothing. You're just, oh, you're incredible. there. And it was just in- insane. You know, if we have this network of VCs, how can we get involved in Pakistan from a work standpoint? Like we go there for traveling. I mean, my brother goes there quite often. I go there quite often at that point. Um, But how do we get involved and actually like, you know, do something that's more valuable than just like chilling. And so the idea of Caravan came about and Caravan is an investment fund. And our thesis was there's a lot of talent in the country, but a lack of resources to support them. And how do you kind of um, close that gap? And so Caravan was started in 2018. We started doing research. We started going back, talking to people. 2019, we launched the first fund. We hired our first partner in, uh, I think, later 2019. And thus far, I think we've made nine investments across different um, sectors from e-commerce to mom and baby e-commerce to uh, beauty to direct direct to consumer to hotels to um, B2B e-commerce to cool. ed- education, um, yeah. a bunch of others. So it's been like incredible. And that also allowed me to uh, come back to the question that you had where like, how do you kind of get the sense of belonging? This, I think really sped that up because now I'm spending time in Pakistan. I'm actually involved in right. the economy in some way. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's been great. That's incredible. So I was part of a really interesting clubhouse chat yesterday about um, can Pakistan have a $1 billion startup and what what vertical will that be in? Um, mm-hmm. And so I would love to get your thoughts on that since you're investing in that space. So the way we look at our thesis is I don't, okay, so if, if you look at the macros, if you stand back and look at the macros of Pakistan, right? Like it's very sexy to say there's 220 million people, there's a burgeoning middle class, there's, you know, smartphone penetrations at 80 million like people. But when you look at the consumption class, it's about a, a a, a sliver of that it's a percentage of that who actually have the ability to purchase the ability to kind of you know be involved in these tech startups that have the ability to kind of you know be involved in these things so it's difficult now if, if you talk about like a unicorn or a billion dollar startup there has been a billion dollar startup and that is um, the EMPG group you know they started off in Pakistan they grew up in they grew in the UAE they grew in Africa so they are one of the first unicorns in Pakistan but it's difficult in my mind still, because if you look at Pakistan as, a, as, a, as, a, as an economy, you can't necessarily, like, and, and especially with startups, you look at scale, right? Like how much can you scale? Pakistan, for me, still is very nascent in the ecosystem. I think it's gonna take a lot of time. Now, when you look at users everywhere else, and especially like when we, when we get startups pitching to us and they tell us that they want to open up in the middle east and they don't have a strategy for how they're going to tackle pakistan that really like you know it errs me like how are you gonna look like you have 200 million people in your population you're bringing an idea from the u.s which has zero inclination of being applicable to the people in pakistan because it's a different intricate economy and then you want to become a unicorn you can't like 
you need to get skill. And for, if you look at the, if you look at China, it's much further ahead. If you look at the UAE um, and the Gulf, it's much more well funded and still ahead of you. India is also way ahead of you and better funded. Afghanistan does not have that big of an economy to begin with. So where do you grow? What problem areas, um, or I guess market areas, um, do you think some startups can start addressing that will, um, you know, that will get scale? You know, you talk a lot about taking ideas from the U.S., bringing them to Pakistan, and then it's not relevant, right? And so what is relevant to Pakistan? So, for instance, I'll give you an example of our portfolio company, Tajir, right? Like these guys went to YC, came back, um, and they're solving a problem that is very relevant, which is logistics, uh, which is also infrastructure. Our infrastructure in Pakistan is not top-notch. It's still not very easy to be able to deliver. Our uh, infrastructure in, in the streets of Pakistan is still those Kirana stores, just small mom-and-pop stores. And if you look at how many wholesalers are required to be able to kind of fulfill that one store, which is about 100, 150 SKUs of products that they have, how do you solve that problem where there's 15 people trying to sell to you with markups that are not standardized whatsoever? Here comes Tajir. Um, which is a B2B commerce player, um, has warehouses and is able to kind of standardize products from Unilever, your dolls and, you know, like the stuff that you buy on an everyday basis and really leverage the fact that, okay, Pakistan has this network of Kirana stores and every, like every mahalla has them, right? Yes. And a bunch of them. Bunch so how of- do you, yeah. So how do you kind of, you can't go to e-commerce right away. You can't, just people don't, re- like the people are not comfortable still. I mean, if you look at any of the e-commerce players, I think 80 to 90% of their their customers are cash on delivery. That's not scalable. So understanding the fact that you have this potential outlet and even that is broken, solving for that, making people comfortable one like in in, in steps is much more easier and and much more scalable than going like, oh, I'm going to open this like AI driven e-commerce store, it's going to give you these amazing recommendations and you can purchase, like, it's just not there. All of these infrastructure things need to happen in terms of getting the ability to kind of, you know, get everyone online and be able to purchase online. So easy is doing that. But then if you look at easy and if you look at actually like how much money people put in their bank accounts, it's still very much used to send money to villages. So it's that, that user experience is in there, that customer experience is in there because it's not meant to be there. So understanding how you tell a story and how you look at a product, that's very important. One of the most interesting things, you know, when we do this work is we research different markets. Yes. And if you look at India and the way India got geofied and when, you know, geo came in and gave everyone free data plans and you start to look at where that consumption kind of went up from Bollywood music to now having like multiple unicorns and getting people online. It's just, you're going to have that same trajectory. You're going to need to get people aware of the whole internet because that, it's, it's going to take less time for sure. We're going to be more uh, accelerated, right. but it's still kind of going to take that trajectory of like, first, it's just going to be consumption. And if you look at Pakistan, YouTube, um, TikTok, Instagram um, is, is, is blowing up. Yeah. So it starts with consumption and then you get to actually like production. Okay. So you brought up that and I, I absolutely love it. It's my favorite handle on Instagram, um, you know, because the photos and the stories that you guys share about Pakistan are incredible. And I fell in love with it even more after you told me about how it was founded. So please um, tell tell the audience, how was it founded? um, And and tell us a little bit more about the name as well and why you guys chose Dasan Ogoy. Okay, so Dasan Goy started in June, no, July of last year, July of last year. And the reason that it was started was me and my wife, Walia, um, who's the co-founder of Das Angui, um, got married in March of last year. And if you guys know, March of last year was the, you know, the, the kind of peak of COVID. Yes. So we both wanted to get married in Pakistan. And so at that point in time, we were in Pakistan. We did a small ceremony in Karachi, and then we went back to our farmhouse in Islamabad. And subsequently, for six months, you know, we weren't able to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So that was the longest period of time that we've both, I think, spent in Pakistan in a very, very long time. For me, it was the first time I spent six months um, in, in one go in Pakistan. And so, you know, we were loving it. We were just, you know, exploring little like places that we could go and, and just exploring the farm. And it was just such a lovely time. But then we'd also see the counter of it where like I'd be sitting down with mom and dad and we just see them like, you know, this guy and that guy. And, like it's always like politics and this and that. And it's never positive. 
So right. you're like, okay, how can we change that? Like we both want to understand Pakistan. We're both interested, you know, in, in the place that we're living in and we're, we're both from. How do we learn more? And we both like doing events. Waliya's always loved doing events. Um, and myself as well, like, you know, throwing parties or getting people together has been something that I love. So doing that, we were like, okay, let's do something online. Everyone's going on Zoom. Everyone's like, you know, locked down. There's no kind of interaction anywhere. So um, Walia took that and came up with this amazing kind of design for what Dastangui is today. If you look at the Instagram handle, it is all Walia. She is the, the designer. She is the, the, the creative director. She's everything in terms of beautification. You've got one very talented wife. Completely. I listen, I thank God every day um, that I was able to find her and, and that uh, she is, you know, with me. And uh, so she did that. And I was like, okay, we sat down with my dad. I think I remember we were sitting down with him in one of the afternoons outside and we we're like, okay, what can we name? Like, what is storytelling? What, what, what can it be? Right. So it was like, okay, it was like Kahani and Dastane. And then I remember, I think it was Walia or my dad that they were speaking about like Persian uh, etymologies and Dastango basically means to tell a story. It's Dastan, which is a story, and then Goi, which is to tell a tale. Um, and we came up with that. And I remember just like, you know, picking up the phone and calling Yusuf Bashir Qureshi Saab, who we were supposed to get for Oasis in March as well, but that got canceled. So yeah. he's a friend of ours and just a lovely human being involved in art, culture, just like when you speak to him, he just like, he's something else. Right. Um, so I called him up and I'm like, Yusuf Saab, can, this is what we're trying to do. We want to tell stories. We want to bring people online. We want to kind of, you know, change the Pakistani narrative. Um, and do like storytelling sessions online. He's like, so bismillah, chalo, I'm down, let's do it. Love it. And then Love it. I started calling other people and like people started like, you know, I remember calling Zen and Zen was like, okay, I am too nervous. Here's Fatheen, call Fatheen. Fatheen's like, go to Hashim. <laughs> Hashim is like this guy who's, you know, super into puppets and does yeah. like creative direction for like some of the most amazing uh, fashion brands out there. Right. I, I, I remember meeting Amna, who is this amazing Katak, uh, not, not Katak, uh, Bharatanatyam dancer who wow. was on the mountains of Islamabad, not the mountains, the hills of Islamabad. And she's like, okay, fine, but I'll be here. Can I do it from, from, from my house over here? I'm like, dude, that's wow. awesome. Yeah. And uh, I met Sharez, who's become a very good friend of ours, who, you know, segments DNA from, from Punjab. And I mean, he's a, bi he's a biochemist, bi biologist, um, but he also plays the sitar and like Rabab and all of these different things. So like, you know, there's just so many incredible people. And if anything, that's Sangwe Suarez, like there is so much out there. Um, and so many things that we're able to to do, it's just. That's okay. Sorry. Um, no. So there's so many things that we're able to do, and and you know people that have their own kind of stories, and yet we overlook it. We have 200 million people. Imagine the stories. Imagine oh, yeah. the wisdom and everything that is yes. living there. And also. I, like Pakistan is not a new, I mean, it's a new country, but it's this, like, if you look at the civilizations, if you look at the historical kind of significance of Indus Valley, of, um, of, of Tatta, of like of Balochistan, of Sindh, it's incredible, man, Bhawalpur, it's insane. I didn't know any of this. And so as we kind of, you know, started doing research, we were like, okay, um, we'll start an Instagram account. We'll start posting stories. We'll do these live events. We did these events every month um, right. and we got new people together. Um, and it's been incredible. Like for, for me and Willie, I think it was a selfish journey of just learning more right. and, and getting people to, because, you know, also our, uh, me and Willie both like remember having this discussion where like, you know, every single time we'd go to Pakistan, I would go on my own account and I'd be like, you know, posting stories from like Hunza or Islamabad and, and people would be like, where are you? What is this place? Right. And I'd be like, it's Pakistan. I'm in Islamabad. I'm at my house or, you know, wherever. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, no, this is, this isn't Pakistan. This isn't, yeah. you know. It's, it's, it's just no, because everyone has this different perception. perception. Yeah, exactly. It's completely and what bad. you it's had perception. growing up is one thing you yeah. mentioned. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I was able to eradicate that. And that's kind of, you know, what we wanted to do with other people as well. Right. Um, so one of the, the things that we were trying to do was what for me, I was trying to do was like get people from, from my friends from Dubai, from France, from other places in, in, in the world to come to Pakistan and experience it because of my wedding. That was going to be my, you know, like my one oh. hurrah. Yeah. that I was going to do, but then no one was able to come, obviously. Um, but Dastan has, has been able to kind of do that for us and really open up the amount of learning that we've had. You know, we've met filmmakers, we've met musicians, we've met artists, curators, um, authors, and it's just incredible. Like when you, 
like just sit down and you're able to research and i'm like the shit disturber willie is the design and and, and the grounded <laughs> person yeah yeah so i'll just like get in touch with everyone and then i'll be like please you come on you come on you come on let's do this let's yeah. do this let's do this and yeah. willie is the one who's able to kind of be like ahmad chill out um, <laughs> and we'll do it but you need to you know phase everything out yeah. so it's been it's been amazing to be honest to kind of see how everything has gone yeah and uh, and and grow it and and look at the stories and learn from the stories it's been amazing yeah. It's beautiful. I haven't been able to go back to Pakistan for a few years now. And it's account like these that I can look at um, and just like, you know, get a sense of, of home. I think I connected um, to the account because I mess you had asked a question about your favorite street food in Pakistan um, on the account. And so I, yeah. I responded back because I remembered the butta wala, um, you know, and zamzama. Um, yeah. and, and so it's, it's those little things where like, you know, it brings back this strong memory and you have such a strong affiliation to that brand. So I thank you and Lilia both for what you're doing because for us expats, it's just incredible work. So my last question to everyone is always, tell me about Chamki Chai traditions at your home. Um, what did you guys do? What did you drink? What did you eat? And what did you talk about? Um, Sham Ki Chai at our house was always with mom. Um, it, I'm not a big chai drinker. Like I'll have it every once in a while. I think Willia's got me back into it because she makes amazing chai these days. Um, but I remember growing up, that's when, you know, my mom always has it like six, seven o'clock. My brother has it as well. So when he moved back here, um, and we'd sit down with mom and we'd watch like dramas. Like that was our drama session at like seven, I think seven o'clock, six o'clock. We'd sit down. I remember watching Hamsafar. Um, yeah. I remember watching Zindagi Gulzar Hai, like right. these kinds of things. That's why I started to know about Mayra Khan and like all these different dramas. Ah, okay. Because my mom is into watching like, you know, soap operas. and All the dramas. All emotional awesome. emotional okay. drama, okay? That yes. is what it is. It's yes. just emotional drama. Um, <laughs> and I would sit down with her and, you know, that hour that we'd spend, it was it was amazing. Um, every, every, other, every, every week, like a few, a few days a week. And it was just that moment where, you know, you're sitting down and, and you're, you're together. You don't need to be speaking. You don't need to be talking, but you're in the presence of everyone. And you miss that when, you know, like everyone is now, I mean, someone's in Canada, someone's in Pakistan, someone's somewhere. Um, so those moments kind of go away. But that is, for me, nostalgia uh, coming, back to, <laughs> coming back to it. But uh, yeah, that is Jai at home for us. Well, that's awesome. And thank you so much for your time, Ahmad. Um, thank you for sharing your journey with us. It was really great to have you on. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you on another episode of Shamki Chai. Take care. Cheers. Love us.